Uh, so last time we talked about nuclear chemistry or got into nuclear chemistry, which is our second to last chapter per se. Um, <clears throat> so nuclear chemistry uh, involves uh, obviously a lot of times the nucleus here and our protons and neutrons. So in nuclear reactions, it's really these guys that uh, do get changed. And these guys are sometimes referred to as nucleons, uh, which are basically your protons and your neutrons, the guys that make up the nucleus. Uh, so in certain cases, we do change protons into neutrons, neutrons into protons and so forth. And because of that, as we talked about, we really do not end up with sort of a conservation of elements in this particular case, uh, because we have a lot of differences that occur in the number of protons, which obviously makes it a different element. Um, <clears throat> so we don't have that conservation of elements when we do this type of reaction. And so when we go to balance chemical rea our nuclear reactions, uh, there's really two things that we need to make sure of, which is the mass numbers on the left uh, will equal the mass numbers on the right, while our atomic numbers on the left will also equal our atomic numbers on the right. So once again, there is no sort of conservation of those elements. And this is how we go about sort of balancing them. It really is the atomic number, as we talked about, that's going to be sort of the one that's going to help you determine maybe what the missing element may be. Um, it may not also be an element. It could be a particle. We talked about several types of particles, like alpha particles. Uh, we talked about beta particles. Um, there's gamma, which has basically nothing. There's also positron guys, which is a positive electron. Uh, there's neutrons, there's also protons that are different types of particles that we come across a lot here. Um, so a couple of terminology that we talked about for sure was that, you know, if something is going through some type of decay through a certain particle being sort of released or uh, some type of emission, uh, those guys will be on the product side, those particles. Any type of electron capture, which is a popular one that we sometimes come across, or if you do any type of bombardment of something, like bombard something with a neutron or something like that, those guys would end up on the reactant side of the uh, equation. So once again, unlike a, a traditional chemical reaction that's not nuclear and based, uh, it all involves really breaking and making a bond. Uh, which means that it's all electrons that are involved. So these guys definitely don't have really electrons involved, but are nucleus sort of guys involved. Any questions on any of that there? <clears throat> okay. So I think we balanced one at the end there. We'll do a couple here in just a second. But uh, again, uh, the major difference, as I just alluded to, is in a chemical reaction, it's, it's really all about electrons. And we really don't touch anything in the nucleus. So the protons remain the same. Uh, so because of that, we do get that conservation of the elements, which is why in a normal sort of a chemical reaction or equation, uh, we balance it by doing coefficients to make sure we got the same number of elements on each side of the arrow. Again, with that nucleus and those protons really being changed, we do get guys that will change into different elements. Taking a look at some of these decay sort of processes that occur and sort of what is happening here. Uh, for example, in a beta decay, which again is this symbol right here, also a reminder that you can represent a beta decay with just the E for like an electron. Uh, we decrease the number of neutrons by one and we increase the number of protons by one. This is a neutrino. We're not going to worry about it here. It has no mass or anything like that, but that's just what that is. You don't have to worry about too much that little guy right there. Uh, but what ends up happening here is actually a neutron gets converted into a proton in this particular case. And that's really why you kind of have to up the atomic number by one, because you kind of increase the number of protons. Overall, what happens as a result of that is that is where our beta particle gets sort of decayed from in that process that occurs as that neutron gets basically made into a proton in this particular case. Overall, the mass number doesn't change, but it really does sort of change, but it ends up being the same at the end. 
And what I mean by this is, let me just draw it in a not way it happens, but we'll just kind of talk about it that way. So basically in this case, what we're going to do is, is take out a neutron basically, which basically would subtract one from the top number there, which would get us to like 13 and six here. Then we're going to uh, form a proton, which would add one to each of these guys, which would then take us back to 14. And we would end up with seven in this case, which would give us 19. So overall, the mass number appears to have sort of changed the same, but we're basically swapping out a neutron from the mass number with a proton that goes into the mass number. So that is why overall the mass number basically remains the same in that situation. Uh, same thing sort of happens here in the positron emission. Again, positron looks just like a beta particle in terms of their symbols, but it definitely will have the plus on it. So most of the time it will look something like this. Once again, if you see a beta symbol with nothing really written there, uh, you could probably very safely assume it is the guy above. If you see a beta symbol, they probably will at least put the positive up there, uh, which would tell you that it is the positron sort of thing. If they don't obviously include the mass number and atomic number uh, that is there. In this case, we're actually taking a proton and converting it into a neutron. The result of that is we will release this positron. Uh, the end result is sort of the similar thing. Although overall the mass number doesn't change, it does technically change because we're taking out a proton, but we're then putting back in the neutron. So again, the, the mass number will remain the same, uh, but the bottom number there will change. So again, if you sort of did the instant slow-mo replay step-by-step -step move here, we're going to subtract off a proton, which takes us to 10 and five. And then we're going to add in a neutron which would take us to 11 and five, which would get us to boron in this particular case. So um, again, we're sort of swapping a proton and neutron and, and that balances out sort of the mass number overall, it doesn't change, uh, but particle wise, it sort of changes as we lose a proton and gain a neutron. Any questions on that there? <laughs> Electron capture is one of the ones that we will see uh, sort of occur uh, on the reactant side. So definitely electron captures like that guy is grabbing onto an electron. And in this case, we're taking a proton to a neutron uh, because frankly, if you add a proton and electron together, the bottom numbers there cancel out and we get a one and a zero, which is a neutron. And the alpha decay is the one here that can be abbreviated with the helium because it really is helium sort of nucleus. Or you can use again, the alpha symbol here. Bless you. And again, this is sort of your biggest change that's occurring. Uh, you got your uh, two change there for your atomic number and four for your mass number. Now, fission is the process where uh, we basically break apart an unstable nucleus into two new nucleuses, like in this particular case. It usually associates with some neutrons and usually a bunch of energy will sort of come off in that process as well. This type of reaction can be spontaneous. So you can have sort of a, a guy that is unstable that will split off into two new nucleuses. Um, you won't always in every situation get the exact same two sort of nucleuses or elements being formed. Uh, there is sort of a pattern of which ones will sort of come, uh, but it won't always necessarily be the same two guys. So for example, in this example, you may not always get uh, those two guys coming out, but you definitely will always get neutrons. You usually always get energy. So it can spontaneously happen. You also can, as we'll talk about a little bit later, sort of help this along. Sometimes referred to as transmutation by basically shooting a particle at something that is stable. It does not like that. It becomes unstable and will sort of go through this fission process. Process. The table of all the stuff we just talked about. All right, so why don't you give this one a go, write the nuclear equation for the positron emission of uh, potassium 40. We didn't do that one yet. That's not the one we did, did it? No, I don't think so. So let's go with that one. All right, see what you come up with. Okay, so let's take a look. So we'll start with potassium and obviously uh, potassium 40, this number and it's a very common way isotopes are written. That number is the mass number. And I know that because if I go to the periodic table, I could find once again, the atomic number up there above the symbol. 
Uh, so that would be a 40 up on top and 19 on the bottom. This is going to be a positron emission. So emission means my positron particle will end up on the product side, which once again, you can use the beta symbol or you can use an electron for that symbol. Here we would approach the bottom numbers first to help us figure out what is the missing number. So that is 19 and one. Uh, so that is like an 18, I think would be our missing atomic number. That is gonna be our good friend argon from the periodic table. Once again, on the left there, we have 40, we got zero, and that is going to get us a 40 there for our argon. Any questions on that one there? That obviously would represent our balanced equation of our, <clears throat> excuse me, our proton being converted into a neutron basically as a result of this. All right, let's try a few more maybe. Hopefully they agree. That's a lot of slides to get there. There we go. All right, so for each of these, write the balanced equations, see what you come up with. Okay, let's take a look and see how you're doing. So once again, uh, that is going to be our mass number, our 238. Uh, we could go to periodic table and get our atomic number. I can go with a 92 and hope for the best. It is an alpha emission. So once again, that's gonna find our alpha particle there on our product side, which you could do helium or you could do the alpha symbol if you like better. Focusing on our atomic number, which really will kind of tell us our element there, that's 92 minus two, which will give us a 90. Going back to the uh, periodic table there, I think it's TH, I hope. And up on top there, that's 238 and four. So that's a uh, 234 when you subtract those two. Any questions on that one? <clears throat> Heading to the next one, that's gonna be a neon 24 for the mass number. Going to periodic table, that is 10 for the atomic number. Our beta emission, uh, minus one. Once again, you can use the beta symbol or you can use the E. Uh, because that is negative one, we do need to go one more because we're really making a neutron into a proton here. That's going to yield us an 11, which looks like our friend sodium there. And once again, although things are changing, we will end up with the same mass number up there as we had 24 on the left and zero on the right. Any question on those two? Nitrogen 13, that's a lucky number seven on there. That's a positron emission. So that's gonna be the same symbolage as beta, except that it is plus one. That also is kind of important because now we need just six for our atomic number as six and one gives us seven on the right and seven on the left. That looks like a carbon if I'm not mistaken and a carbon 13 if I'm not wrong there. And lastly, that is a beryllium, which is a seven and a four, I believe, for beryllium. This is an electron capture, which means capture is on the reactant side. So it's going to grab that electron there. So in this case, we just need to add up the bottom number. So that is four and minus one is three left over, giving us our friend lithium with a seven up there on top. Questions on balancing nuclear reactions. Not too hard, just need to add in the periodic tables, a pretty good thing yeah, to have. Any questions on any of those there? So we're gonna talk about stability here of these nuclei. And there's a couple of different things that we're going to look at in terms of stability. And one of the first thing we're going to look at in terms of stability is uh, what is referred to as the N to Z ratio. So this is sort of a look at stability. And our N to Z ratio, N being neutrons, Z being really the atomic number or the protons. So it's really our neutron to proton ratio. And <clears throat> What we're looking at here is, you know, is it a good ratio or, or a bad ratio for that nucleus? If it is sort of a bad ratio, it will mean that that ratio will either be too high or too low. 
And the result of that is that guy will go through some type of radioactive decay uh, in that case. And what it's going to try to do is move itself closer to, as we'll see in the next sort of case, uh, what is referred to sometimes as the belt of stability or valley of stability. And it's an area where you have sort of a good ratio of protons and neutrons to protons. So when we talk about being too high, we're sort of on this side of that valley there. And if we find that our ratio is too high, what will happen is some neutrons will be converted into protons and it will go through a beta decay. And as it goes through a beta decay, it will then move itself closer to a more stable situation. Will it perfectly fix itself after one decay process? The answer is it might, but it probably will not, but it should move itself to a better ratio coming closer to sort of that belt stability. Now, on the other hand, if we're kind of too low that ratio, what's going to happen is we're gonna convert some protons to neutrons, and that's gonna kind of bring up our guy closer to the belt of stability. And it's gonna do that through either a positron emission or an electron capture. Um, it can also do a alpha decay, but it's not as efficient. So for us, we will stick with just a positron emission or electron capture if the ratio is too low. And you may be asking, you know, is that maybe two different things? So let's take a look at our last guy there, which was beryllium seven. And the last one we did was this guy. And it was an electron capture. And we ended up with this. Now, if I did a positron emission starting with our same guy, we would have this and we would end up with, as you can see, the exact same outcome. So you could do a positron emission, which would be the bosom, or a electron capture, which would be the top. And they both will yield you basically the same guy at the end of those processes. So that's why in the case of being too low, you have an option as to which one you wanna do because they both get you to basically the same place. Any questions on that? So too high beta decay, too low, one of those options. And again, may move you closer to a more stable situation. So what are we talking about stable? It is this guy right here, which is our yellowish. And this is sort of a stable uh, situation. Some people call it the valley stability. Some books and people call it the belt of stability, whichever way you like. Now, how do we know what's a good ratio? If your element is between one to 20 in terms of its atomic number, a nice ratio is a ratio of one, is a pretty good ratio. If your element's between 20 to 40, you're looking more closer to a 1.25 as a pretty stable uh, ratio. And about 40 to 80, it's about 1.5. That is why, as you can see here, sort of the valley and belt kind of goes off of that sort of one line, if you will, uh, because it's a little bit more um, higher needed as you go higher in terms of protons and neutrons. Anything pretty much above 84 there will not be stable. So those usually will be radioactive. So for us, what we're going to do to make it uh, a little bit more simple, and again, it doesn't apply perfectly, but just for us, we'll make it simple. We're going to use these cutoffs as pretty much hard cutoffs. So um, if it's one to 20, then it's like a cutoff of one, and it's either it is one or it's too high or too low. Uh, 1.25, again, too high or too low, or 1.5, too high or too low. There is sort of a gray area that sometimes occurs, and that is obviously in the 20th. This guy ends at 20, this guy starts at 20. So again, there's sort of a buffering region that some people will go, well, it's still okay because it's sort of in that region. Same thing here, this guy ends at 40 and this guy starts at 40. So there's sort of a, a buffering region between the two. So unless it's super close within rounding, like almost right on it, uh, we will use this as really just hard cutoffs and we won't worry about sort of gray areas. So once again, either it is that number or it's too high or too low, uh, depending. <clears throat> Any questions on that there?
And obviously the buffering range would happen with something like 20, where, you know, anywhere from one to 1.25 would be sort of considered stable. And obviously anything from 1.25 to 1.5 would be sort of stable for something in the 40 ish region. Um, but again, we'll kind of stick to more hard cutoffs and I'll try not to give you any that fall in that area. So why don't you take a second here and see what you come up with. Uh, is magnesium 22 stable? And if not, which type of radioactive decay will it undergo? Magnesium is lucky number 12 on the periodic table. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, so obviously we're gonna look at stability. So we want our neutron to proton ratio. Uh, so we'll start with just the symbol there, which would be 22 and a 12. That means protons, we have 12 as M is the atomic number. Our neutrons would be our mass number minus our atomic number, which would be 10 in this case. Uh, so we would take 10 divided by 12, and that's going to get us uh, not 0.833. This is an element that is between one to 20 as the atomic number is 12. So one to 20, our good ratio there is a ratio of one. In this case, our ratio is too high or too low? It is too low, right? 0.83 is less than one, so that is too low. So we're on this side of the valley, we need to bring it up. We're way back here, by the way, but we're on that side of it and we do need to bring it up. And in that case, it will go through one of two options to do that. It will do a positron emission, which means you would have this guy here giving off a positron particle, making an 11 and a 22, which would be sodium, or it could go through the electron capture. which once again, will give you an 11 and a 22 and sodium. Any questions on that there? So did it fix us? Again, we're probably here. Did it bring us back upwards? We formed sodium 11, which if we then kind of put into our proton to new, our neutron to proton ratio, uh, it would be 11 neutrons and 11 protons, which would give us a ratio of one in this case. It definitely, in this particular case, actually moved us to a pretty good ratio of what we're looking for. Won't always happen like that, that it goes to a perfect ratio or something like that, but it definitely should move you in the correct direction. So we were too low. It definitely moved us upwards to a higher number uh, in that particular case. Any questions on that there? All right, then why don't you try Krypton there. Krypton is uh, 30, 30, 36. Sounds good. And again, why don't you write the equation for what occurs in this situation? Okay, let's take a look. So uh, that is a Krypton 85. Once again, from the periodic table, we get 36. That would allow us to calculate our neutron to proton ratio. Uh, so that's going to be a 85 minus 36. It's going to say 49 for our neutrons by subtracting these two numbers. And we're going to divide it by our 36 in this case. Gives us a 1.36 ratio. In this case, Krypton is a 20 to 40 guy where an acceptable ratio is 1.25. So again, upon comparing these two here, we are a little high. So if we draw our belt of stability there, we are sitting on this side. We need to bring it down to that ratio. So to do that, because it's too high, it will go through a beta decay. So our 85 and our 36 Krypton We'll go through a beta decay. And that would then yield us a 37 and an 85 in this case. And 37 is our RB. Now, when we look at RB, did we hit a perfect ratio? Well, if we take 85 minus 37, gives us 48 neutrons divided by 37 protons. Uh, yields us about a 1.3-ish, 
which is at least moving downward. So we didn't hit a perfect ratio, which is oftentimes the case, but we did at least move in the sort of correct direction to get us to a much better sort of situation. Any questions on the neutron to proton ratio and how to calculate it there? They agree. There we go. All right, so that's one way that we look at stability. And it's a pretty good way to look at stability. There are some other things that we sort of look at uh, when we sort of try to determine whether or not something is stable. Uh, so obviously our neutron to proton ratio. Uh, we also could look at the stability by uh, whether or not a isotope there has an even number of protons and neutrons. So if you have that situation, as you can see from the table at the bottom, that is sort of ideal. There's like 157 stable nuclei that have an equal number of protons and neutrons. So if you just quickly look at your isotope and you got even protons and neutrons in it, uh, it's probably pretty safe to say it's most likely going to be relatively stable in that situation. The next stable thing would be to have even protons, odd neutrons. The next best thing is odd protons, even neutrons. The worst thing in terms of stability is if you're looking at an isotope and you look at it and you calculate it, you got like an odd number of protons and an odd number of neutrons, there's only like five of them that are relatively stable in that sort of configuration. So that's another very common way that people look at stability is that's like even, even, so that's pretty stable or odd, odd, that's not going to be as stable. Only a few have stable guys have odd number of protons and neutrons, as we can see there with only about five uh, being that. There is also, uh, if the total number of nucleons adds up to a magic number, uh, the nucleus is more stable. Uh, it's kind of like uh, electron configuration where everybody tries to get to the noble gas guys. Uh, that's sort of a stable situation. Uh, it's most stable when you have either neutrons or protons that is 2, 8, 20, uh, 28, 50, 82, and your Powerball number is 126 for your neutrons there. Uh, these are, you know, sort of magic stable numbers here, or magic numbers, if you will. Uh, so some people will look at it and go, well, it, it has like eight neutrons, so it should be relatively stable, or maybe it's got eight protons, it should be relatively stable. So those are some other ways that people look at stability. So uh, neutron to proton ratio is a really good way, kind of even, even proton neutrons is also a good way and again if you happen to hit a magic number of the lottery there that's also another good way of doing that any questions on stability there so when things are not necessarily stable sometimes they will continue to go through uh, a decay process until they really hit something that is uh, relatively stable um, so what we start with is sometimes again referred to as sort of the parent nuclei and what we end with is the daughter nuclei. And if we have a lot of sort of decay processes occurring sort of back to back, uh, that is what is sometimes referred to as a decay series. And to determine the stable nuclei at the end of a series, if you don't want to have to write out, say, each individual reaction that occurs, you could count up how many alpha decays you have and how many beta decays you have. And for every alpha decay uh, from the mass number, you could subtract four. And from the atomic number, you can subtract two for every alpha. And for every beta, you basically could add one back to the atomic number. And that's sort of a, a quick way of doing that that you can get to uh, you could get to what's at the end without maybe writing every single step out. If you want to do it with every single step, which is not necessarily a bad thing because you might actually, you know, not mess up too much. Say we started with something like uranium-238 and that's like a 92. And let's just say, for example, we do a very short decay process, which obviously will not get us. It's probably something stable. 
but let's just say we had something like this where we did an alpha alpha beta beta decay all one after the other so if we were to write this sort of decay process let's clear this out so we got some room here you could do it absolutely just like we did with balancing equations the first thing you would do is you would start with your 238 and your 92 uranium the first thing that happens is it will go through this guy right here and do an alpha decay uh, which would then get you a 90 and a 234, which would be our TH. Now, since this is a DK series, in a series what happens is the guy that's formed then goes on the reactant side and continues to go through the DK process, which in our made up example here would then also go through an alpha DK and we would get the same deal. That is going to give us like an 88 and a 230 going to periodic table, looking at 88, uh, that's 84, 85, 86, 87, 88. I'm getting old, what is 88 there? Help me out there, 88 is, is it RA? RA, right, yeah, okay. Tony, they need to make it bigger. It's just not big enough, you know. That's how you know you're getting old. You can't see the giant thing on the wall. All right, 23088 would then become our next step, uh, which would actually go through a beta decay here. Uh, then we would do something like this. Obviously, we would need to add, which would get us to an 89 in this case, and a 230. And our 89 here would be uh, one more above there after our 89 would then be to the AC. Yep. And then lastly here, 230, 89, our AC would then get us our beta particle, our last little step here. And that would then obviously get us back to a 90 and a 230, which would give us a TH. So as you can see, you can just do uh, basically balancing nuclear equations for each of these. What you form in the first one is what you start with in the next one in a sort of DK series. Now, if we were maybe just interested in like, I want to know just sort of what I get at the end of this very short made up process, we could use uh, sort of this down here. And in this case, we basically did two alphas and we did two betas. So starting with our original number 238 and 92, uh, the two alphas would mean I would subtract four, I would subtract four from the mass number, I would subtract two and two from the atomic number. We then did two betas, which means I would add one back twice there to our atomic number. Taking all that into consideration ends me with a 230, which is what we see here. And taking 92 minus two is 90, minus two is 88, plus two more takes us back to 90, which is what we get here. So you can sort of shortcut it if you're kind of just interested and all you're dealing with is alpha and beta decays uh, by just kind of keeping track and doing a little math there and it'll kind of tell you what you would get at the end. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> okay, so uh, again, I personally think, you know, maybe that's a good way to go because you know, probably won't mess up, but you know, it depends on the question, I suppose. All right, and here is pre-circled for me there. <laughs> there is uranium two, uh, 238 and it's DK series. And you can see it gets all the way down uh, to lead at the very end. It actually splits off at some point here. It splits off kind of two pathways and they both eventually will end up over here at uh, lead 206 which is relatively stable a question on a dk series okay so what we're going to talk about next is uh radioactive dk and really the kinetics of radioactive dk which is good since finals are coming up it is a nice refresher for kinetics the good news is Radioactive decay will follow always first order kinetics, which we remember, right? No, I don't remember that. That was week two. This is like week 14. So if you remember really for first order kinetics, there's two kind of important equations and that is our natural log of A is equal to natural log of A naught 
minus kT. And we had a half-life equation that is the natural log of two divided by K. Now in sort of nuclear chemistry, they do sometimes like to use some different symbols, but they're really kind of the same thing as what we did previously. So as you can see down here, they'll sometimes use N for nucleide instead of concentration. Uh, so if you like A, you can continue to use A, it's the exact same thing. Also, we called this obviously when we did kinetics, the rate constant, it is sometimes referred to here as the decay constant. And it also sometimes is actually used uh, in nuclear chemistry with the lambda symbol, which is a very badly drawn lambda symbol right there. We'll try that one more time, the old college try there. <laughs> um, not sure that was better, but uh, sometimes we'll use the lambda symbol to represent a DK constant. Um, so it all follows the first order of kinetics. Although when we did sort of kinetics earlier, we did use concentration always as sort of A, right? So the concentration of A, uh, and you absolutely could use that. But a lot of times in sort of radioactive decay, uh, we do use other units. So uh, it's very common. We can use grams on both sides. It's perfectly fine, milligrams. We also could use a unit of radioactive decay, like counts per minute or disintegrations per minute. So this guy, although you know, when we did connect, we kind of like said it always got to kind of be concentration. It doesn't necessarily have to be, as long as the units on both sides are the same. Um, and again, like I said, grams, milligrams, rates of radioactive decay are very commonly used in here. As you remember these two graphs, and here's more of the nuclear chemistry version of the natural log of A is equal to the natural log of A naught minus kt. These are the two graphs that we commonly see in first order kinetics, right? Starts to decrease with time. And if we do our y equals mx plus b version of this, we yield a straight line where the slope is equal to minus the dk constant in this case. So again, it works the exact same way as our first order kinetics did uh, when we saw it before. Also a reminder that in a lot of cases, you will need to use both of these equations together. So a lot of times, especially in sort of nuclear chemistry, they oftentimes will give you half-lives. Uh, so a lot of times you'll need to use the half-life equation to solve for the DK constant or the rate constant. And then you could go into really your time and concentration sort of equation and solve for whatever you're looking for. Also a reminder that you want to be careful with these two guys here in terms of units, right? In terms of units, they need to be the same unit of time. And a lot of times they are different. So you want to watch those guys out. The units for the first order rate constant or DK constant should be one over seconds or some unit of time, like we talked about, right? Is commonly what we see here. Here are some half-lives. Obviously, half-lives is the time it takes for half of whatever you started with to basically go away. And some is very, very long, as we see on this chart here, uh, like 4.5 times 10 to nine years. I don't think any of us will be here after one half-life, sadly. Um, as opposed to some that can be very, very fast, which we're all here for radon 220, 55 seconds or so. So every minute it's going through a half-life and obviously the type of... Um, DK. So why don't we try one here? So approach it the same way as uh, as a normal reaction here, and you probably need the half life of that, which I don't think it's on here, is it? No, it is not on there. Let me go. Is it on your handout? Yeah. Was it one point? What do you guys? Two point eight six years. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. All right, then go for it. You do have the information you need for it. So we're looking for basically how many milligrams would be left over after five years. Good throwback here. So once you see anything like this, it should always be uh, first order connect. So you could just, again, if you want to use the other symbols, you can, but you could still use the same ones. Obviously, we've used before. I'm just going to highlight the KT right there. <laughs> There's a reason, maybe. Uh, Half-life there is the natural log of 2 over k. So in this case, uh, we are looking for how much would be left over, which would obviously be our final. 
Uh, this we obviously have, and we obviously know we're going to go for five years. So we are missing the decay constant here. So this is where the half-life would come into play. We saw for the decay constant be the natural log of two divided by 2.86 years. And natural log of two is 0.693 divided by 2.86 years gives you zero. No, try that again. Natural log of two divided by 2.86 gets you a number 0 0.242 reciprocal years, right? So one over years, which is what we would expect. Uh, now our years here are okay because we do have years here. So as we talked about a second ago, which is why it was pre-highlighted for us, uh, we want to make sure that those two are the same units, which they are. So we could go into here, natural log of A will equal our natural log of 1.35 uh, minus our 0.242 years, one over years, and our five years here. Once again, the years are going to cancel out. So that's going to give us the natural log of uh, 1.35 minus uh, 0.242 times five gets us the natural log of A is equal to minus 0 0.90989. We're going to E both sides there. That gets rid of that. Gives us a concentration here of that and that. I'll call it uh, 0 0.403 in this case. The units here would be the same units as our original guy, which would be milligrams uh, to match, obviously, the milligrams that are here. Question on that one there. <clears throat> Makes sense is DK, which means my final should be less than what I started with, right? So if you got more, then you're going in the wrong directions. You're anti decaying. Yeah, so don't laugh that. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so you can hopefully see it is very obviously, I would say similar, but it's pretty much the same thing as what we did uh, in the Connects chapter. So I want to try another one here. Radon, there is uh, Half Life 3.8 days. How much will be left there in 5.4 weeks if we started with 10.24 grams of it? Here, we're going to do our first order. And we are looking once again for uh, uh, how much is left over there. And uh, we know how much we're starting with. We know the time period. So once again, here we are missing uh, the DK constant. We also, if we look at our time units, have a little issue here with units. One is weeks, one is days. So you have to do some type of conversion. Uh, so I'm just gonna convert the days into weeks. So uh, I think there's two days in a week now, seven days in a week here would be good. Uh, 3.8 divided by a seven gets us something like 0 0.54286 uh, weeks. We'll go into our half-life and solve for DK constant, which is the natural log of two divided by the half-life gives us the natural log of two divided by that number I just scribbled there, 0.54286 uh, weeks. And that gets us a natural log of two divided by 0.54286 gets us a uh, 1.277 reciprocal weeks. If I did not mess that up, try that one more time just to make sure. Okay. Now that we got it in the same units, we should be good. We got our natural log of A will equal our natural log of our initial, which was 10.24 minus our 1, 1.277 reciprocal weeks times our 5.4 weeks here. Those guys will cancel. And that gets us a uh, natural log of 10.24 minus uh, 1.277 times a 5.4-ish. This is a natural log of A is equal to minus 4.5694. 
doing our E of both sides there will get us something like 0 0.0104. And again, this would be something like grams, I think, here. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> So obviously, uh, radioactive decay, basically first order kinetics, same first order kinetics, obviously, that we've done previously. Any questions on any of that there? All right, I think we'll lay it up there for today.